A script. Do we have a fucking script? Uh, I have no? it. No? Fuck it. We're doing it live. <laughs> yeah. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Oh, no way. Oh, my God. No way. Oh, my God. Feels so good to hear that. Welcome everybody to episode 116 of One Million of the Serial Chillers podcast. As always, I ask, how goes it, Paula Greg? Thumbs up, my friend. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. That's a thumbs all thing. the way the fuck up. <clears throat> We're also here with Bobby and Jeremy, and we'll get more. We'll get a little bit more from them in a moment. But first. Most of you know how the show works, but let me explain it for anybody that doesn't. Each week, I sit down with old friends, new friends, good friends, and bad friends to tell the story of an infamous serial killer, something true crime, dark, creepy, unsolved, or otherwise mysterious. If you guys have questions, be sure to chime in, because if you have questions about questions, be sure to ask questions, because I cannot answer questions about questions if you never ask questions. Are there any questions? Oh, you do have one. Yeah, I have one question. Okay. What can I do to be number one guest up in this? Be- you got to beat Mama Shy, which seems no. impossible. No, that's impossible. That's impossible. You might beat her at the game. Man, yeah. Oh, put me on a Mama Shy episode. All right. The, the battle has the, the bell Ooh, has been rung. We just have our Mama first shy. So I'm hold on, I, I do want first shout out challenge. Don't fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> no. With that, welcome to and let's play the Serial Chillers Podcast. All right, guys, question number one. Yes. Jumping right into it. No, he, yeah. In what year did this event take place? We don't get nothing? Nope. Nope. Just what year? That's, see, that's what I told you. Like, you don't need to prepare because it's not going to help. I try, bro. <coughs> it never works. So usually, well, you know, we'll have serial killers. There's only so many. Right, right. We've moved on to a lot of events and things. This is something, you know, that has popped up. This is actually, I need to mention, too, before I even get to your answers. This is another brought to you by, I sprinkled in a little bit on this one, too, I might say. Uh, brought to you by Kelly G. So Kelly, Kelly G, G, this is 100% her work. She does great work. <coughs> oh, my gosh. Kelly G, you're a legend. We got a couple of research assistants, and okay. I'll get to it when we get there. This is double research assistant, so I, I, I was a little hands off on this episode. I will say, and the way it's coming out, I feel bad. But I'm pretty sure the last episode that's going to have aired was going to be a Kelly G episode, and then the so Kelly G, you're going back to back. You're in there. That's not how it's supposed to happen, but yeah, normally you're supposed to rest your starting pitcher in between. But like listen, you went out there. Off, you know, but, it's World Series though. We yeah, need you. World you went out, Kelly G, and you did it. And uh, we love you, you but uh, fuck your rotator cuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna give you the big off season contract. Don't Enjoy worry. that Tommy John surgery. <laughs> <laughs> we, the guaranteed money's there, dude. Don't even trip, dog. Um, so thank you, Kelly G. Uh, all right, guys, what do you think? I'm going to go with a 1973. Damn, I went for a 1974. Mm-hmm. Did you? I actually did. <laughs> did you? Did you? Right. I, I was it. like, are you trying to price this right in? No, dude. He really did say 1974. I really did. All right, I'm just like, hey, listen, buddy, first. listen, buddy. I'm just fucking making sure. Give Bobby 250 points because this happened August 23rd, 1987. Ah. All right, let's do some full guest intros. Woo-hoo! I'll let Greg do that. Well, oh, I can do this, actually. Um, Bobby, you got the first one right. We'll say what's up. You've been here a million times, but, you know, you might as well say hello. Do the spiel. Come on. Hi, yo. I'm Hardcore B3R. You can check me out on Twitch, Instagram, TikTok, whatever you want to find me. I'm there. I usually go as underscore, underscore, B3R, underscore, somewhere around that lines. It's all synced up now because I've worked on it. Sink your shit. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being here again. Can we take a little credit and say the show is the reason you're synced yep, up? 100%. Right. No, no, right. literally full credit because it was the episode when I was on with JP, JP and he was like, Bobby. Did you know 
JP is in town, and I almost pulled him tonight God. before I hit you up. Before I hit you up, and he's like, oh, "I don't think I'm gonna be able to cool, do it." Cool. And then I was like, "Fuck, who can I get?" And I was like, "Dude, I haven't talked to Jeremy in forever. This motherfucker's gonna be on." And he was. So. Uh, yes, oh, congratulations on sinking your shit Thank and you, your JP. first 250. There's 14 questions, Jeremy, which means there's plenty of time. And I say to you, welcome, brother. Thank you, thank you. Glad yeah, to be man. here, man. Yeah, first time guests. I will say, first time guests generally have a lot of uh, beginner's luck. Okay. Uh, so I hope you get you get rolling here. I will say tonight there are a inordinate amount of multiple choice questions. Okay, well, there are a few where you're just gonna stab at it. Other than that, but okay. it was just kind of a. I realized how many I was writing, and I went back and I was like, but these are the questions I want to ask. So okay. Uh, but there were things where, like, you're not going to guess it if I don't give it to you. So, welcome, guys. Uh, may the best man win. Um, good luck. Go, go. Turn that out Hell just yeah. a little. Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm coming there you for go. you. Um, <laughs> everybody out there listening, make sure you check us out on all the social media grams. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah, we're at SerialChillersPod.com. That's where you can find everything. There is literally the homepage, SerialChillersPod.com. You look right there. And there is a link for the Instagram. There's a link for the TikTok. There's a link if you just want to donate one time. You don't. You're not down for monthly. You know, I don't want to give them every time. You want to give a little bit of money just to help out the show once. You could do that there. You can give to the Patreon, which is a monthly thing. But if you give a dollar, um, you get a shout out. Greg, we're gonna pull it up and we're gonna do it before we eat this episode. We're gonna take a break and I'm gonna pull up the list and we're gonna do it at the end. So everybody, shout outs. If you may have already heard it and you may have not, we, with our lost episodes, we don't know what happened. Uh, so we're, everybody who's on there right now is getting a shout out at the end of this episode. So yes. hang tight. If you haven't heard your name, you're gonna. If you have heard your name, you're gonna. Uh, but yes, the Patreon, you can give there. It helps us a lot. We appreciate you a lot if you do that. Um, and then everything you saw on the screen there, guys, you can call us. You can text us 1-805-666-2513. Uh, you can send all the cool drugs and explosives. Uh, P.O. Box 1229, Clovis, California, 93613. Thanks. Make sure to uh, send the dangerous shit at Hella Greg. And LonelyFans with two Zs dot com. <clears throat> that is, yeah, yep, yeah. Make sure to check that out. We do really own that. Uh, references for this episode come from Wikipedia, unsolved.com, encyclopedia of Arkansas.com, uh, thv11.com, unsolved mysteries.fandom, obstruction of justice, the Mina connection, an epilogue. This was a documentary. Kelly G uses lots of sources because she's dope like that. I'm usually, all, I'm usually all Wikipedia and my brain. Yeah, that's my sources are always the internet at large. <laughs> Murder on the Tracks, the story of Kevin Ives and Don Henry. Murder on the Tracks, the massive cover-up of Devin I Kevin Ives and Don Henry. Unsolved Mysteries, Season 1, Episode 2. Hey, what you know about that? It's right out of the gate. early Unsolved Mysteries episode, yeah. Uh, True Crime Garage Podcast, Crime Junkie Podcast, and Necronama pod Podcast. Okay, so you guys are in. You've got uh, well, question number one went down. Bobby's got the lead. Around 4 a.m. on August 23rd, 1987, a train conductor and his crew near Alexander, Arkansas, in Saline County, spotted something on the tracks in their path. It took them a second, but as soon as they figured it out, it was two young boys, a rifle, and a green tarp. They hit the emergency brakes and laid on the horn when they realized what it was. Later, they checked the decibel level. That's like a thing. So if somebody gets hit or there's an accident, they check the horn. They, you know, there's obviously a full investigation. It was a properly working horn. It rang at 98 decibels, which is the equivalent of a jackhammer. So I'm sure we've all at some point yeah, in our yeah. life heard a jackhammer. It is not a <clears throat> quiet pneumatic instrument. I um, will say if you're old enough to remember the old iPods, like with the wheel, yeah. <laughs> those turned all the way up were 120 decibels. Oh, shit. Wow. So, I used to listen to that shit full blast. So did I. So I'm just saying, like, but you could miss it. Well, I mean, loud, but this is also loud. well before iPods, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In 1987. Yeah, 1987. So yeah, well before iPods. Even those crummy fucking headphones that had like the metal band that always pinched your hair and yeah. like had the two little yeah, uh, like Star Lord's got yeah. Oh, shit. I don't know, man. Walkman. Yeah, um, Walkman headphones. Yeah. Um, Ouch. But yes, as loud as a jackhammer. Um, we we live in an area where people die by train. We have a train that goes through here. We have a college very near a train uh, passing. So Fresno City has a death like almost yearly at least because that train track passes like almost like through the campus. Yeah. And somebody, you know, someone will have their headphones in and they'll get fucking whapped at that mm -hmm. thing. It happens more often than you think. Hot damn. 
I'm not saying it's like a very often thing, but I've gone to Fresno City for lots of semesters where like you couldn't get through Only one way because and, and then I dropped. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm I not saying it. I graduated or anything. <laughs> 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 okay, so the train conductor said that the boys never so much as twitch. So they were like, "Holy shit, is that you know? Is that kids? Is that kids? And they're like, "Get the fuck out of the way! Get the fuck out of the way!" Um, the train that night headed to Little Rock with 75 cars, 6,000 tons. And one mile long, going a little over 50 miles per hour. Yeah, so that thing's not stopping. Question number dime. two. Oof. How long did it take the train to stop? Is it A, quarter mile, B, a half mile, C, three quarter mile, or D, one mile? 50 miles an hour, 6,000 tons, 75 cars. It's one mile oh, long train. How long does it? Questions aren't up on the screen because we're working on that. So I, uh, quarter, <clears throat> half, three quarter, or one mile. I, I didn't know if you were about to like make a guess at no. it before. I, I think I know the answer, though, because uh-huh. I remember the NTSA commercial. Uh, okay. I'm just giving you what Kelly G brought me. So I don't No, know I know, but I mean, okay. like, I think I know the answer. All right. All right. So I want to guess first. Okay. Uh, once Bobby's got his written down. Yeah. That's that's a lot of writing for a quarter <laughs> or half, three yeah. quarter. All right. All right. Uh, what did you say? What do you think, Greg? I, I think it was a full mile. Okay. I think it's uh, three quarters, but this wasn't spelled right. I think it's uh, one quarter. It's literally the only one the three it, of you didn't it guess. It's a half mile. mile. Yes. Damn it, it. Took, uh, it took about a half mile for ah. the train to stop. <laughs> Damn. Um, unfortunately for the conductors inside. Hashtag rigged. <laughs> I know. It's like the NFL, dude. You guys didn't get the script today? Um, I did, but I saw my storyline and didn't like it. Yeah, so it took, over, uh, it took just over a half mile for the train to stop. Unfortunately, the, for the conductors, they said that they could hear each thud and crunch. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, when you're right there. Yeah. Because um, when you're the conductor of a train, it's not like you sit back a ways. Like, you're kind of right up on the very front of the, oh, the forefront right, of everything. Right, right. Oh, so they didn't just get punted um, off. They just... Well, they were... So what you heard is they were wrapped in a tarp, possibly. <coughs> we're going to get there. Um, Buckle up, Bobby. So the the train alerts another train heading in the parallel direction and tells them to please stop and call for authority. So like, I think the conductors are shook. Like for for a second, I was like, why didn't they just fucking call? How could you not be? But yeah, that's when I was like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So they had they stop another a parallel train. They're like, dude, please. Well, I was gonna say, I think too, right. stopping the other train is like, hey, there's a crime scene back there. Don't yeah, fucking drive yeah, into yeah, it. Yeah. So um, hot damn. Yeah, yeah. So when the train finally stopped, so that was the other thing too. The train was coming in, and, and they had to go a half mile past the boys. So they told the train that was going in, like, "Yo, call authorities. It's going to be back here." So when the train finally stopped, they ran back to the site, and they didn't see the green tarp that they had seen covering their torsos. When authorities arrived, everyone was shocked at the lack of red blood at the scene. Lots of purple, dark, globby blood, like it was not fresh, like the train oh, hadn't. Shit. Yeah, it means like the train congealed. hit hadn't been the thing that, that killed them. The investigation was started. Saline County Sheriff's Office were told to treat it like an accident, so immediately less evidence was sought after and collected than needed to be if there was going to be some type of murder investigation. Um, they let the parallel train leave, just like pieced out, like they didn't take any statements, they didn't um, say like, what did you see? Uh, they didn't believe the crew saw a gun because remember we, they said they saw a tarp, a gun, and some boys. Right. Uh, and then they didn't believe some in the stand ex- by me action. Yeah, and then they didn't believe in the existence of a tarp. I know I'm coming at you rapid fire, but question number three: wow. How did they explain away the tarp? Was it a? They just said the crew was lying. Now nah, you're lying. There's no tarp. B. Uh, it must have just been blown away in the wind. C. No, nah, it was an optical illusion. Or D, they said, oh, shit, here it is. And they actually did find a tarp. See, I would have thought it would have got... Were they, they said the crew was lying, that the tarp blew away, that it was an optical illusion, or they actually did end up finding the tarp. I would have thought that it got, like, shredded by the train. Yeah, but then there'd be pieces of it, right? I mean, but if it's a... You didn't get If it's a dark green... If train. it's like... I'm thinking when you said it was, like, a green tarp, I'm thinking, like, a... OD green, like rucksack, <laughs> military green type thing. I think the only dudes that know that are the conductors of that train. Um, you want to guess for fun? 
they had it. <coughs> they said, oh, yeah, we got it. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, same thing. Same thing? Yeah. I'm going with – that shit blew in the wind because the train's going so fast. Yeah, that that's, shit... that's – the cops might have said that. Um, the cops gathered the crew. They took their – you know, and then they said, I, you know, we think about the tarp. It was an optical illusion. Ah, fuck. Bitch. Classic government answer. <clears throat> was, uh, uh, yes, the thing you saw, you did not, in fact, actually see. <laughs> Thanks, Will Smith. <laughs> uh, the boys' legs had been across the rails, and their torsos and heads were between the tracks parallel to each other, and they were face up. Their feet ended up being chopped. So think they're inside the train tracks. Their head yeah. and torsos are in between the tracks, and their legs are hanging over. Okay. That makes sense. I'm yeah. trying. I was doing a yeah. bad job being near the mic to explain that, but but yeah. So they were like, uh, like when you lay on the couch and put your feet over the end. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Oh. The, the one thing the monster can get is your feet. <clears throat> um, the feet ended up Not being chopped. Covers, <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. The one part hanging over. Oh, shit. That's what you. So their feet ended up being chopped, and their torsos Fuck. were dragged, and they weren't very intact when they were indeed found. Kevin <laughs> oh, Ives shit. was 17, and Don Henry was 16. And they were popular young boys in the area. Question number four. Damn. Damn. Each boy drove a pretty cool car. Pick two of these, and it's 250 points for each correct answer. Oh, we're getting a unique ass question. Yeah, you got seven options here. All right, here we go. And two of these are correct. We got this. Up to 500 points of this. Come on. Did they drive a Corvette, a Camaro, a Trans Am, a Firebird, a Thunderbird, a Supra? Or a Coupe de Ville. Ooh. Corvette. Camaro. Trans Am. See, I put something for everybody on Yeah, there. I know what I want. A Firebird. To a Thunderbird. A Supra. Or a Coupe de Ville. Two of those are correct answers. 250 points for each correct answer. I've got another kind of unique what question later. What is the second too. bird again? A thunder. Fire and thunder. 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 <laughs> yeah, like I want I want it to be the, the Camaro. And because you want to say bitch and Camaro, well, because bitch and Camaro, but also <laughs> like I just fucking love IROX. And, I am a fan of IROX too. And that national race and of champions, baby. Eighty-seven, true. Like right. would have been pretty fucking cherry. I see what you got. Would have been a bitch and Camaro. Oh, dude. All right. So you you think bitch and Camaro, and, and you want Coupe de Ville? No. Oh, okay. I had a Coupe de Ville. I, I want I want it to be um, Smokey's car. The. uh the Thunderbird. Oh, yeah, yeah, Okay. What do you think? I think it's going to be the Camaro and the Supra. All right. What do you think? I'm going Firebird and Thunderbird. Chirp, chirp, oh, bitch. Uh, the oh, Bird Boys. Y'all you know saying they okay, Bird so Boys. You they said, chirp, sorry, chirp, again. Camaro, Supra. Camaro, Supra. Uh, 250 points. Fuck. Okay. Yes, Camaro is one of the answers. Fuck. Supra is not. What did you say again? Firebird, Thunderbird. Don drove a Firebird. <sighs> 250 points for each uh, of them. 250 uh, points for so each. So it's a wash on that one. You guys both got the Let's opposite go. answers, though. All right, both scored some Shit. points with that one. Teamwork, boys. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to be, you know, like, that was fun, right? That was a fun yeah. new way. That's there, good. There's one later where I only give you, where I give you open options. Oh, shit. And you have to get both. Oh. Yeah, buddy. But it's something where it's not this like an infinite amount shit. of stuff, you know? Um, yes. Okay. So Kevin drove a Camaro. Don drove a Firebird. They're pretty popular young dudes. You know, it's like a fairly small town. Um, they'd been friends for a few months. They went to Bryant High School, and on August 24th, they were supposed to start their senior year. On the 22nd, they were hanging out in a local parking lot with teens, and they went back to Don's house around midnight. And Don went inside. Kevin hung out on the porch, and Don asked his dad Curtis if they can go spotlighting. You guys familiar with? Spotlighting. Yeah, you go out and you shine a spotlight in some deer's faces, and then they freeze, and then you shoot them. You ever hear like stop like a deer in the headlights? Yeah, yeah, for that. Yeah, so you that's because take when out you shine a, a light in a deer's face, they, they freeze. freeze. So it makes it super easy to shoot them. And that's it's, it's mad illegal. <laughs> it's crazy illegal. But you know, <laughs> like the backwoods or whatever, hey, you go out spotlight. with a huge spotlight. Yeah, you damn put it up in that's their face. Damn it right there. Yeah. So uh, they, you'll hear throughout this story. This is very like small town. Oh, sure. Like like. There are so many like little things that you're like, that wouldn't happen yeah, you know, like now sense. and or here, you know, because it's just it's very. <laughs> so they drove cool cars. They were cool kids. They're about to start their senior year. Um, they wanted to go spotlighting any illegal form of hunting where you shine and freeze animals in their place and then shoot them. Um, they took Curtis's spotlight and they were off. So, you know, his dad, Curtis, like, I don't give a fuck, man. Just be safe. You know, he, was, he wasn't at all like a neglectful dad. It was just like, hey, summer's almost over. You guys are about to start school. Like, yeah, you can go do this thing. So um, 
they took Curtis to Spotlight, and when Curtis woke up around 5 a.m. on the 23rd, he noticed that they had not returned. Ah, oh, shit. He drove around looking for them as he knew where they were likely to hunt, but no luck. He was prepared to call Linda Ives, uh, Don's mother. Linda Ives was not going to enjoy this shit because the last time, sorry, Kevin's mother, uh, last time Kevin had slept over, Curtis had called Linda the next morning to, uh, as well, sorry, Don had gotten into a disagreement with Kevin and Don had left and not showed back up. So, like, these guys get together and they get, you know, they're boys will be boys, you know. But this is the second time that this dad has had to call the mom and be like, hey, I don't know where your son's at. Just so you know. shit. That's always a tough phone call to make. Mm -hmm. Just to be like, hey, uh, no, your kid was never here. (laughs) Sorry. You dropped him off here? Uh, I don't think so. Really? Because my kid said he was at your house. I watched you wave at me as I drove away. (laughs) No, that wasn't me. I don't think you can prove that in a court of law. I have a dash cam. Nah. Nah. No, I don't think so. Can I see it? Just in case. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, boop, 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 boop. Damn. So, um, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, they get into trouble together. Um, Don had gotten into a disagreement. This time he's prepared to make the phone call again. Uh, she also didn't know where they were, but figured where they would turn up. So also went out looking for them. Um Go back to the tracks where authorities find a hat with a local electric company logo with the word Henry written on it. This led them to Curtis as he was a superintendent at the, at the company. And Curtis knew Don wore this hat frequently and called Linda again. And so he had gotten information that the boys had been shot and hit by a train. And so... How did he get that information? From the police who just oh. called him. Like, we got your boy's oh. hat. Like, you know, that's how they just... Oh, okay, they, okay, okay. They okay. pretty much identified him by that <coughs> Got it. I thought, Small he got, I thought he got the information and then went out. Oh, and, no. So, okay. Curtis is the dad, and he gets it, and he calls Linda, and he's panicked. He's like, oh, they were shot and hit by a fucking train! You know, like... Great. Shit. Yeah, yeah. Smooth. Yeah, yeah Shit. exactly. My boy! Excellent yeah. crisis response. All right. Well, he was a construction superintendent, not a crisis God, negotiator. Somebody tells me they faked their death, but... Um, so they faked it? I feel like they faked it, bro. Put it on another body. Yo, boom, boom, spoiler, I haven't heard this episode yet. <laughs> oh, no, my bad, my bad. <laughs> Yo, they're pretty dead. I'm just going <laughs> to throw that out there. Not a zombie thing. Um, so <laughs> Curtis frantically told her that they had been shot and were hit by a train. The parents pretty much immediately thought the investigation seemed shoddy from the beginning because they initially went to, oh, it was an accident. Clean, you know, get it cleaned up. We'll find the next of and we'll let them know. It wasn't like, hmm, this is clearly, you know, yeah. coagulated blood and the lividity of this. And, but you know, there is science that's wrapped around it and it's clearly not being followed. Even in 1987, you know, like that may not have been the height of DNA evidence or no, anything, no. but, um, but there they were procedures. Were, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They had these exactly. reports like this where they had a feeling that it wasn't, yeah. then they knew. So um, the parents, like from the beginning, pretty much to the end, are never going to be satisfied. And 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 look, we try not to disparage the police f- just for no reason. Because I know they got a tough job. Yeah, and, like, we, but if we've got a reason, you know if, somebody, ha- if somebody if somebody hands you disparage them, if somebody hands you like pieces of a body, and they're like, yeah, this was found with a gun and uh, a tarp, and it was that's your job today. Hey, clean this up. Put this in this bag. Get it all cleaned yeah, up. Yeah, like okay. that—that's a—that's a tough thing to do. And then but, write a report about it when you're done. Yeah, but also to take the to take the the fact that these kids were just sleeping on train tracks and didn't hear a train horn or whatever, and oh, it was just an accident or whatever. Like that's the whole thing vibrates hell of fucking hard. Well, this is the okay. So the first reason that they felt like the police weren't doing a thorough job is. Um, the they get back the boys' belongings, right? What belongings they were able to recover. And in one of the pockets of one of the boys, they, they found some weed. And it's like, shouldn't should the police have found this weed? Shouldn't they? In Arkansas in the late 80s. They're like, you guys need this more than we do. Yeah, like, I don't. And so it's just like Shit. one of those things where it was like, the parents were like, why didn't they even go through their clothes? So like, yeah. what, why didn't they see if there was some type of clues as to what could have happened to them? But also, how many murder investigations do you think small town Arkansas in the late 80s has had to deal with? Probably none that they've actually realized happened. Right. Let, let's keep going because it's fun. Question number five. Keep five. Five. Fuck. Question number five already. Woo. I know we're kind of burning through it here a little bit, but I start slowing down. All right. Yeah, uh, there were good. just good spots for. Well, yeah. The, the first few rounds, you got to come out hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always come out hard. Out Question number five. Something was left behind at the scene and not found until two days later. Oh, what shit. was it? A Don's arm. Oof. B, Kevin's foot. Ah, oh, shit. C, a bloody shoe, 
or D, a large chunk of unidentified human remains? None of those are like fun options. I thought you were going to be like a a pager, a belt. I realized what... Once I realized what the real answer was, that I couldn't do that this time. Yeah. So was it Don's arm, Kevin's foot, a bloody shoe, or a large chunk of unidentified human remains? Also, no matter what the answer is, it kind of goes to show you that the parents might have been right about what was happening here. (laughs) None of those things left behind are really good luck. Uh, Yeah, none none of those are things you want to leave behind. All right, Bobby, you got your answer. Super. You secretive. can just put the letters too. I have the. I have. He's got the a whole thing he wants here. to. You're welcome. You no, do it however no. you like, dude. I'm you just do doing. It. You do it however it. you like. However you are, Confidel. Bobby, do you want a fucking folder to put up like grade I school style? <laughs> <laughs> Here's, the thing, bro. Here's the thing. You said your Patreon's gonna might might get these. I want it's, them to, to see my mind as in there, in there. In but there. not Jeremy at all. What's your answer? <laughs> What's your answer, Bobby? Mine's large chunk, man. Yeah, I'm gonna go. With large the chunk of unidentified human remains is I'm on the same. Not the correct answer, <laughs> Sorry, gentlemen. Speaking of poor investigations, the foot. Kevin's foot was found oh, two days later in plain choice. sight after gut. being left behind <laughs> by the investigators. The people who found the foot also found nearby a very large <coughs> a very large piece of cardboard with what looked like blood on it. It looked like the cardboard could have been used to drag bodies. Oh, like a flattened box or something yeah. that you just put them yeah. on so that they slide easier. Even one sheet of some pretty good cardboard, you could drag someone on, you know. Uh, <laughs> I've done the math. <laughs> um, Hell, if you lay the Sunday Times out just right, you can do it with that. <laughs> so it was given to cops. Uh, the cardboard never entered into evidence, what? even though that there was like clearly blood what on it. Fuck? Never entered into evidence. So that means it just sort of Do you think it, just splatted? it like splatted from the train that far that it just hit some cardboard? Even if it did, it needed to be entered into evidence. Yeah, like when you when you watch like <laughs> when there's like any type of human remains from accident or possible crime, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna want to uh, retain that. Yeah, you know, they, yeah, because the like, safest possible place. Not when there's a sheriff in town. <laughs> you got one prison cell. So uh, <clears throat> that's what I imagine. Uh, probably not far off. This investigation is weird, dudes. But then the deaths are ruled an accident. Uh, we're going to talk about two autopsies, a really dumb one and a normal one. They tripped uh, and fell, both hit their heads on opposite rails. <laughs> what are the odds? The first one was performed by a man named, I think it's Fami Malik, uh, the medical examiner in the area. Malik says the boys were intoxicated by marijuana and couldn't move to get out of the way of the train. Listen, I'll just tell you right now. Yeah. Couch lock, buddy. <laughs> totally. Uh, probably I'm not. Dancing this whole episode. <laughs> totally, probably not. As you say, I've, I've eaten a thousand milligram edibles and gone to play hockey. I don't feel like. Yeah, there's no yeah. way. Some 1987 ditch weed. Hey, is listen. Make when your when your entire knowledge is hearsay and uh, why can't I think of the movie? Reefer Madness. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. They were living in a single bedroom We used to play Reefer apartment. Madness all the time at Harold's. It's a great movie. Yeah. Good for a laugh. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Witnesses say Malik said the boys smoked around 20 joints prior to laying down on the train tracks. Like, well, okay. Now, if I had smoked 20 joints, I also would not be able to move. So, <laughs> Listen, as somebody who does enjoy a joint. Yes. Every now and again. 20 of I them. get like... Ooh, Two thirds of the way through one, and I'm like, we smoke. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you, know, you want me to put this out? Like, we smoke the rest of it later, right? Like, I was say, we I'll smoked one two days ago, and we didn't finish it. Yeah, it's like you know, even with nice pot, it's like that's too much. The bong has water in it for a reason, yeah, my yeah. guys. Like, <laughs> so yes, no, they probably didn't do no, that. No. Also, there are two grams how, on. Them. How many boys? Two boys. Two boys. Two boys. I mean. Well, Maybe two each. Man, well, yeah, there's no way. I, they had one point. It said they had one point nine grams on them because when the when the parents found it, they gave it back to the police, and then the police were like, "Oh shit!" And they waited. They're like, "One point nine grams." Need to marijuana. talk to their dealer. He shorted them. <coughs> or they smoked a little, but like so he brings the parents in. Uh, 
the uh, Fami Malik does. Like, shut up and lay down. Uh, brings the parents into the to the morgue uh, with their sons on the tables, essentially. Wow. <clears throat> the parts of their sons on the tables, and oh. then he takes a Polaroid picture of the parents. Like, oh, I must take pictures of you. No, takes I'd, pictures of the parents, nah, that's um, that's um, right. and then he tells them about the THC intoxication. Pretty much like just throws it on. I'm like, oh yes, your boys were all fucked up on the marijuanas. <laughs> Um, they were definitely higher than the kites. Um, and so the parents are all confused and like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Like, we've got questions. And he's like, I have no answers. And he pulls what out like envelope. Radio Shack. He pulls out an envelope and tells them that these are the autopsy photos and they won't have any questions after they see them. And then an officer in the room is like, yo, what the fuck? Like, they don't want to see that. Yeah. And he like stops the, the coroner from giving them to or the medical examiner. Um, he has samples in a jar and he tells them that this is one of the boy's brains. Then he like sticks a pencil in and pokes at it. Look, this, this, is, this, this is from the, pa- like, look, I was not there. Okay. <laughs> but this is from the parents. I think everybody's making that shit up. And then that it? one cop actually corroborated that like he was going to fucking, sh- oh, you won't have any questions after you see this. Um, damn. Where did I get yeah, this guy? Yeah, Stanford? yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Stanford. Oh, because so, of the prison experiments. If, if it seems weird, here's a couple of deaths that uh, Fami Malik also ruled on. Raymond Albright was hit five times with a Colt 45. Malik ruled this a suicide. James Millam was found <laughs> without a head. He said, and, we also found two zigzags, and that was all we needed. <laughs> James Millam was found without a head, but Malik ruled it natural causes because the man suffered from an ulcer. He ruled it natural causes because his head was missing and he died. Well, naturally. Yeah, yeah. Literally, he was like, oh, no, he had an ulcer. Do you see here? So that's what killed him. It's he not his head right Yeah, off. it's not the Unrelated. Head Unrelated. Uh, when asked about the head, Malik said that the family dog probably gnawed it off and then ate it when they found the head later. Malik claimed that the dog had probably just puked it back up. Just full contact head, a complete head. This is this is like the county medical examiner. No, what brother. He seems like a bad character from like a shitty TV show. Holy shit! And look, Kelly G does. We saw the references and the citations. Yeah, she didn't like get one website, copy the article, and go. All right, here you fuckers go. Like she does good work, and I like and a lot. You know, I I leave her opinions in. They are Kelly G's. I will say. Uh, I don't disagree with most of them, yeah. uh, but she writes with her heart for sure. And she's every time I've double checked anything, not that I've ever not trusted her, but sometimes I'm like, interesting, that be true. And I'll look it up and be like, well, I'll be God motherfucking damn. That is very true. Holy shit. Um, this guy has a job. <laughs> this guy has a job. And like people are like, yeah, that's how he is. Like th- those are those are reports you can read. Well, you, Did he do the thing where he pokes the brain sample in the jar? He just jabs point. it with a pencil a couple of times. He did that to us. Even if he didn't, he was creepy enough for them to make it up and us to be like, hey, he maybe did that. He maybe probably yeah, did that. that. That's plausible. <laughs> so um, it's interesting enough that he's such a bad doctor. When Malik is asked about it, he said people don't like him because he's Egyptian. What? Uh, yeah. He's like, no, I'm, I'm an Egyptian guy. That's why no one around here likes me. Uh, everybody's like, no, I won't tell anybody actually... how they built the pyramids. Yeah, so. He's like, no. Well, didn't that guy get shot five times and you rule it a suicide? And he's like, yeah, but did you know he also had an ulcer? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he had a sore throat, too. And I think he might have died of that and fell on five bullets. On the way down. <laughs> oh. I'm just saying. Okay, so how high were these boys, according to Malik? Uh, here we go. Uh, re- reported numbers say that they were anywhere between 97 and 120 micrograms per liter of blood. Uh, these are relatively high. Um, the information that was used on blood, they said the information that was used on blood was intended to be used on urine, like the way they changed the micrograms a liter, so it might have been an inaccurate test anyway. Yeah. Um, but that's not like the number there is not like, whoa, it's like, yeah, those people were probably pretty high. Like 20 joints. I have to imagine would play even of ditch weed. Like I was going to say, like Greg was saying earlier, I think he didn't finish, but he and I went out front and smoked a joint, two thirds of a joint yesterday and it was enough. Yeah. You know, (laughs) together saying 
No one's smoking 20 joints no. consecutively. No. The no. press conference was so uh, moving and so important that it practically went viral and it opened a grand jury case. Oh, shit. Yeah. Uh, viral before viral. Damn. Yeah. So That's hard. Question number six. <laughs> what happened in the grand jury case? Is it A, nothing? They were just dismissed more. B, they were able to rule the deaths a murder. C, they were able to exhume the boys for a more competent doctor to autopsy. Or D, they were able to prove the police were hiding something. So there's a lot of uh, pathways you can go down here. Uh, One is that they just get fucked over more once they get to the grand jury. One is that they are able to actually get it switched from accident to murder. Uh, They're able to exhume the boys for a better autopsy. Or the police are hiding something. They just get proof that the police are hiding something. Uh, Jeremy, what do you say? I'm going to go with they got a new autopsy. Okay. Exhumation and autopsy. That is correct. 250 (laughs) points for each of you. Uh, uh, What's uh, that bring the score to? uh, It'll be 750-500, Bobby. Okay. Plenty of time. Eight questions remaining. So, yes, it allowed the boys to be exhumed for another autopsy. And it switched the jurisdiction to their little, whatever, I can't remember the county police, but to the Arkansas State Police. Okay. The second autopsy was by Dr. Joseph Burton, a nationally renowned medical examiner from Atlanta. He found a stab wound on, stab wound on Dawn, a puncture in the back made by something sharp, not by the action of the train, said the doctor. Okay. Uh, he also found a wound on Kevin's skull consistent with the butt of the rifle that they think they saw at the scene. Uh, Dr. Burton claimed Malik had mutilated and butchered Kevin's skull, leaving impossible to tell if the skull fracture, where the skull fracture started or ended. The other doctor fucked up his skull so bad that he's like, I can't tell what the train did and what that doctor doctor did. did. Yeah. Um, man. So he said in his vast experience that he had never seen anything like it with, with this autopsy, the manner of death moves from accidental to homicide. Before we go any further, we need some backstory about this particular area of Arkansas. This is 100% documented. In fact, you can look it up. There was a ridiculously successful cocaine smuggler in the 80s named Barry Seal, who worked for both the cartel and the CEI and DEA. Apparently, there's a 2017 movie called American Made, which was loosely based on his antics. Familiar with the movie? Not familiar with the movie, but I know, you know about this the, dude? I know about the CIA smuggling cocaine through Arkansas. So he moved his you base know who of else operations. Was involved in that? Bill and Hillary Clinton. Oh, that's oh, that's he where was the governor. He was the governor, but that's where they um they owned like a an airstrip out there that the CIA used to land on to to offload their cocaine. Oh shit! Hot Shots man. fired. Okay, so he would have planes fly. He moved his base from Louisiana to Arkansas just prior to this event happening. So sometime in the late eighties. Um, he would have planes fly low and stop without turning off the engines, drop the drugs, jump back in, bounce out. Like the planes were on the ground for a minute. Um, people started noticing this. So they adapted a method of just flying low over the areas and just dropping the drugs. They don't even stop the plane. Like, yep, sure, there you go. <laughs> Hopefully it all uh, survives. So, uh, Barry gets murdered in 1986, Hot damn. but this, so much shit is going to continue. Several pilots said that the area where the boys were hit was for sure a drug drop spot. Like where around where they were hit by this train. That's where they aim. Yeah, that's where we're dropping drugs. For sure. Uh, There is a lot of information about this, and it leads up through the government, and it's super interesting. So you can check it out. Uh, This isn't what the podcast is, uh, so look it up if you're interested. Thanks, Kelly G. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she put the segue Let's in there go. for me. Uh, <laughs> the MENA airport, or MENA, M-E-N-A, um, is something to search surrounding all this stuff if you want. So let's talk about these witness accounts of what happened that night. Tom Niehaus was about 13 at the time, and he and his friends were out looking for weed plants and generally messing around. He was kind of dragged forward in 1993 to say what he saw. Um, apparently he was in some bushes and some people on the tracks. Um, we're out on the tracks and then the boys walk up. He said the boys seemed uneasy and looked like they wanted to turn around, but the first group engaged them. He said that he saw what they thought was a fight and then a gunshot and then they fled. Tom was, quote, 200% sure that he knew someone in the first group. 
this man had dated his mom, and this man's name was Dan Harmon. Not not that one. What? Not my boy. <laughs> not both of them. No. <laughs> nah, take that, Justin Roiland. <laughs> Um, okay, so remember that name for later. <clears throat> Tom, Harmon, who is the 13-year-old, is going to pass the polygraph test and was put into witness protection after all of this, but later decided that he didn't want to continue. He definitely is also dead now. Um, oh, but, they got him. But, but Kelly G said she can't find anything of him dying from nefarious means, but he definitely is dead. No, he got him. Much younger than he should have died. So wait, wait who was he in this process? He was just a, a witness. witness. Mm. That came forward, got put into protection, said and, that, and then said nah. he was a witness saying that this was a drug drop spot. Is that saying that he saw Dan Harmon and another group engage with the boys in a fight and a gunshot? Gotcha. So he's like a little kid at the time. Uh, he's later dead. Mm. Mm-hmm. But again, Kelly G says she can't find anything about him dying of nefarious means, but definitely like probably someone that should still be alive and is not alive. Although it seems likely uh, based on, but it seems likely that some nefarious shit might have happened based on what we're like going to hear. Um, Char- Charlene Wilson was also uh, claimed that she was one of Dan Harmon's girlfriends. She gave several confessions over the years, and they seemed to get more detailed rather than less as it went on. So she was someone who was like, every time she came forward, she had more detail about the story. It wasn't getting That's more suspicious. convoluted. Is it? That is. It gives you more time to put together the story. <laughs> well, yeah. they Well, because like <clears throat> we've talked about it before where your brain's not a file cabinet. It's a file cabinet full of photocopies. And every time you remember something, you pull something out of the file cabinet, you photocopy it, you throw the original away. Even if you're recalling it every day? Yeah. Because every time you recall it, you're recalling it in a different light. Okay. Like, I could tell you the same story two different ways for t- two different situations and make it relevant to both. So I feel like somebody who's adding details down the road... Now, I could, un- I could understand if you were like, you know, listen, I was thinking about it and it was actually closer to this time than it was this time. And you're correcting things in your story. Sure, I get that. But somebody who's coming out later down the road and being like, yeah, I've got this and this and this and this and just keeps adding more and more details, that seems suspicious to me. Well, I think it's, she's finally just kind of not giving as much shits as she was of her own protection and her own like, safety. Yeah, I don't know Could what it was, and I don't know exactly what it means that, that she had more detail. Maybe it was that. It was yeah, like, it no, just, okay, I think this is actually what's And I mean, who the fuck am I? I'm just some guy on a podcast. I just, really, It just seems really, suspicious yes, to me. Really so she said that she and Harmon were at the tracks that night for a pickup of drugs. Question oh, number seven. Oh, a pickup of what two drugs? There is, is no it? multiple choice, is... but you get 500 points if you give me both correct drugs. Oh, shit. 19, 19, okay. I need two drugs that came on, that were getting dropped off in that spot that they were there to pick up that night. They need to both be correct. Any nickname for them is fine. I have a guess, too. Okay. We'll let them. Let uh, them. Got, hold on. <laughs> okay. Okay, what's your answer, Bobby? Coco, you know, and opium, like Oxycontin and shit. Okay, okay. Uh, Coke and marijuana. I also said coke and marijuana. Well, I feel like they, it's Arkansas. They would grow it, you know. Give Jeremy 500 Fuck! points. Fuck! Because they were to pick up three to four pounds of coke and five pounds of marijuana. God damn, five pounds of marijuana is so much. It is a lot. So I sweet. Three to four pounds of coke is you a lot. You think they would just grow <laughs> That's a lot of coke. You think That's they would just grow the marijuana there, though? Um, Why would they drop it off? Maybe it's because it's honest. It's part of a <laughs> it's part of a CIA drug smuggling scheme to bring drugs to the inner city. I know that. That's no, know that that's but that's close. where it starts. That's how they get. That's how they they but, got the cocaine to make the crack to put the to put in the inner city to make easy e make records so that they could kill them with AIDS. <laughs> so Charlene said that the boys were watching one of the drug drops that night and got curious and a little too close. She said that they were chased and brought back. Um, her story involved. Okay, so she's saying that there were more than two boys, but Don These and two Kevin were caught. the one that got caught and brought back. Her story involved one of the boys that were brought back were already dead, oh, and one being killed, and in one version by McCaskill, uh, who was another guy who was there, and in one version of the story by herself. Not both her story. Uh, mm. Someone else said she did it. She said McCaskill did it. Um, and both being placed on the railroad track. So she says one came back dead. Whatever, either she or another guy killed him and they put him on the railroad track. She told her story that included Dan Harmon to authorities and she passed a polygraph test to, I mean, for whatever that's worth. In 1987, that was the fucking holy grail of truth. 
Now it's pretty much almost inadmissible. Uh, question number eight. What was she given for her confession and testimony? Is it A, immunity? B, a new job with the police? C, straight cash, homie? Or D, a prison sentence? <laughs> immunity, a job, money, prison. Confession and testimony. What do they give her? Immunity, a new job, money, prison. Money. Yeah. Money. All right. Uh, Jeremy. I'm going to go with prison. Prison. I went with prison, too. Prison sentence. You guys are the same wavelength. For her confession and testimony, Charlene was given a 31-year prison sentence for a first-time drug possession. Yeah. Oof. like you're like... Uh, why you tell us that shit? You just literally confess that you're in conspiracy with these people. And Does that not seem a little hefty for a first-time drug possession? Yeah, drug oh. smuggling. She got a drug possession charge. Yeah, not but even, it's but it's Kansas. Okay, that's it's true. Arkansas in the late eighties. Like thirty-one years. No, no, some broken. Who's Dan Harmon system. in this? Or there's some behind-the-scenes shit. So. um... Keith McCaskill is one of the people that Tom and Charlene was rumored to have seen that night on the track. He was rumored to be some muscle for the drug drops. He told that he knew about the case, and afterwards he was knew that he was in danger, even going as far to making some small funeral arrangements in case something happened to oh, him, shit. and telling some members of his family goodbye. Like he's this convinced that that he's in trouble. Um, the Clintons are after me. I don't know. I'm not going to survive. Oh, he was right. He ended up being stabbed 113 times. Every stab was above the waist, signifying that he fought very hard. And they and, and Dr. I, Malik I, said I he was a suicide. Up, I, <laughs> I looked up why they Kelly G might have said that, or and then they would have said that that being above the waist means they fought hard. And it's because like nobody stabs below the waist. That means he was standing. Yeah. Until that yeah. 113th stab, probably. Like That's how Caesar of him. <laughs> oh my god. Do you know if there's any like? I don't, I don't know anything other than he was stabbed 113 times above the waist. Damn. Keith Coney was a teenager and one of the last people to see the boys alive. He was with them the night on his motorcycle. So he's potentially one of the guys who was there. And, and got away. He, right. Um, he told his family and law enforcement. Oh, he told his family that law enforcement was to blame for the boys' deaths. He, before he could even clarify what he said, he was fucking dead. He only made it to May of 1988 and died in a motorcycle crash, though it was said that his throat was slashed before uh, I mean, the motorcycle this, was crashed. This, none of this is surprising to me. Let's keep going. Ooh, that means something good's coming. He, oh, no. uh, he did have a grand jury subpoena, uh, this kid who was killed, and Malik ruled his death accidental as well. On January 20th, somebody accidentally slashed his throat and put him on a motorcycle. We're going to travel to the future a little bit here. Oh, shit. Ooh. If you're a wrestling fan, you'll like this. On January 23rd, 2018, former 80s WWF wrestler posted a video claiming to know something about this case. Who was it? Don't worry. I uh, looked back to question. make sure that it was going to be correct. Question number nine. Oh, shit. Which late 80s WWF wrestler posted this video? Was it A, Billy Jack Haynes? B, King Kong Bundy, Ooh. C, Butch Reed, or D, Don Morocco. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing any of the, most of those right. Billy Jack Haynes, King Kong Bundy, Butch Reed, and Don Morocco. Each of these four men would have fought in at least one WWF fight in some point in 1987. Uh, and that's what this is when th these gentlemen would have been active. Okay, Bobby, do you got your answer? Yeah, dude. Donnie. He says Don Morocco. I'm going to go with Butch Reed. Butch Reed. Billy Jack. On January 23rd, 2018, former WWF wrestler Billy Jack Haynes posted a video. He claimed that he, at the time, was an enforcer right, at these drug drops. Yeah, dude. He claimed an Arkansas politician, Don Harmon. Dan Harmon. <laughs> There's a lot of different names. There's a lot of names in this story. That was when Kelly initially sent it. She's like, dude, this was much longer, but there were so many fucking names. I just started cutting people out of it. I was like, thank you, because this is already, this is a lot of names. Holy There's shit. a lot of people involved. Don't worry. Okay, so Billy Jack Haynes, 
posts a video. He claims that he is an enforcer at these drug drops. He claims that an Arkansas politician wanted him for muscle, so money and drugs didn't get stolen. Billy stated that he witnessed the death of Don and Kevin. Fuck. He also claims that he told Linda Ives, the mother of Don, that, um, lost my spot. Stop looking into it. Uh, told Linda Ives that her and her private investigator the name of all the people involved in 2016, two years oh. before he put out the video. So that's how far she's able to get when he's like, here's the information. Yeah. And they're like, fucking wait, we don't care what you say. Um, he also claims, no, no, Mike Crook was another man. Uh, that's unfortunate a, that's a, name. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a good name for a... He's a local club owner, Mike Crook. Yeah. Perfect, right? Trust Mike Crook's that. honest business. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he heard about a crazy story from one of his customers, Jerry. This guy, Jerry, nobody really knew, but he always refused to give a real name. Everybody knows a Jerry. Yeah. Um, he was rumored to be in that parking lot trying to catch his cheating wife and oh. saw three boys on a motorcycle. This would have been the three... On that would motorcycle? that was to say that would stick out if I saw three guys on one motorcycle. Yeah, well, that was Don. That was Don, uh, Kevin, and the what was the kid's name? The other witness. Yes. Yeah. Oh, whatever. It's back there. But yeah, remember they said he was there with them on the motorcycle. Holy shit. Um. Yeah. So. Don't worry, I'll hide it, Mike Crook. There he is. Okay, three boys on a motorcycle. Cops pulled into the parking lot, and the boy on the motorcycle rode away. The one boy, not three. Jerry said he saw the cops beat the shit out of the two boys that remained. Crook talked him into going to tell the police what he had seen, even though he was super hesitant. Upon his report, police threw Jerry... Sorry, you know what? I was incorrect about it. I read that incorrectly. The bartender doesn't want to give up Jerry's name. It's not that Jerry doesn't want to give up his name. The bartender is calling him Jerry. He's confidential informant. Yes. Yeah. And they threw Jerry in jail for 90 days for alleged child support that he had owed. They, they found something. You know what I mean? Uh, they told him to leave town and not to come back. Like He's a fucking Western, too. Like, this town ain't big enough for both of us. Who is this guy? Oh, Seymour shit. Skinner? They just tied uh, him to a train and sent him yeah. out of town? Yeah. Oh, so he ended up moving to California, and no one has been able to contact him since. So long, Jerry. Another guy named Ronnie Godwin had been drinking. This was one of the other parts that I was like, this is small town. He had been drinking, so he was taking back roads home to get home around 2 to 2.30 a.m. to avoid the cops. Don't want to spill your road soda. <laughs> he was on the road and that and near that same parking lot and saw what he believed to be an undercover cop car. He knew it was an undercover cop. You could tell. Yeah. yeah nobody's that dumb. Um, so he pulled off the road to a place where he, essentially like he saw the cop car before the cop car would see him. I'm on private property. Yeah, so he like, pulled over and parked in that same parking lot. Uh, remember, he doesn't want to get a DUI. So he said he saw the cops go up and beat the boys as well, put them in their car, and drive down a dead-end road. He knew it was a dead-end road, so he waited until the cops came back out because he didn't yeah. want to get a DUI. Uh, he said that he waited about 15 to 20 minutes, and they did come out, but after they had come out, he could not tell if the boys were still with him. Ron identified the cops as Lane and Campbell, two of the dirty cops we had kind of talked about before. He saw one of the boys being hit in the head, and the reason they didn't kill this guy is they just discredited discredited him for all the... He was a booze hound. They were like, this yeah. guy's a fucking drunk ass. What the fuck does he know? He pulled over, hella faded. Yeah, I'm definitely, he's, he's fucking putting the nail on us, huh? I was like when Kang and Kodos cover Homer and booze yeah. and send him back. I saw, uh, I saw some big space aliens. Sure you did, Rummy. Right. <laughs> so here's a list of more people surrounding this case that would eventually turn up dead. Greg Collins was to testify in front of the grand jury and was murdered. Two shots to the body, one to the head with a shotgun. <sighs> Fammy, suicide. suicide. Fammy Malik took this autopsy and ruled it a suicide. Come on. Yeah, I'm, but, telling, I'm telling you. I will tell you it. right now. I was not lying when I said the Clintons were involved and every person that they've been involved with that, that has died has been ruled a suicide and it's all been suspicious. This is not like a political him. thing. No, it's this just... is like you can find the names and see the reports. So them saying this is a suicide, I'm not surprised. So uh, Booney Bearden... Uh, was friends with Keith Coney and Greg Collins. That's a and also, good name. Yeah. He also went missing. They found his clothing near a place where he was rumored to have been murdered, but they never found him. 
Um, he had also been subpoenaed to serve on the grand jury. Jeff Rhodes told his family he too was informed about the boys and of McCaskill's death, and he was shot in the head. Richard Winters was killed in a robbery that police say looked like it was staged. He was also cooperating with the grand jury. Jordan Kettleson was shot and cremated before an autopsy could even be performed. What? He was believed to be involved in the death of Keith McCaskill and was rumored to know about the boy's death. Mike Samples was another grand jury witness, and he was also shot to death. You start tying up loose ends, and you create more loose ends, and you got to tie those loose ends up, and then you got to get somebody to tie those loose ends up, and that's another loose end. So why do so many of these people end up dead? Why is this such a shit show? Oh, yeah, because... Dan Harmon is the prosecutor in the area. Get fucked. What? In fact, he is the one who appo- who is appointed special prosecutor after the pes- the parents press conference. He's the he specifically for their case. No. Uh, no. Okay. We have a ghost in the office. Okay, so Dan Harmon, special prosecutor in the area. He's the prosecutor in the area. Um, It is later found out in a heavily redacted FBI document that he was at Judge John Cole's house, the ju- like the main judge in the area, <laughs> and was like, yo, could I just be appointed to like special prosecutor of that case? And Judge John Cole's all, fuck yeah, you can, brother. <laughs> Clink. And then, you know. They- That'd be cool as hell. <laughs> yeah. So Linda Ives believed the boys, quote, saw something they shouldn't have seen. And this makes all the sense right in the world, right? Um, On December 31st, 1988, the grand jury um, that the press conference had prompted was closed by Dan Harmon and Judge John Cole. And they ruled that the jury's findings would not become public record. The foreman for the jury is quoted as saying that the public needed to know what had been sealed. So the the foreman of the jury was like, I can't tell you, Le- like I fucking can't, but the public needs to know. And the two dudes who are in charge are Judge John Cole and Dan Harmon, and they were like, oh, but no, yeah. you don't get to know. So he sucks to suck, nerds. Yeah. Damn. So let's talk about a nice lady named Jean Duffy. She gets put in charge of a drug task force for three counties, Saline County included. That's where we are here. Her very first day, her boss, Gary Arnold, says, quote, you are not to use the drug task force to investigate any public official. She starts to get the information that will lead to um, several uh, public officials. Meanwhile, Dan Harmon becomes the elected prosecutor for the three counties. Not just the prosecutor job he had. Uh, he would and start his cocaine empire grew. He would start a smear campaign in the local media against Gene, no. and they touted illegal arrests, missing federal funds, and were so he was just saying all this shit. You know, this bitch is arresting. None of it was true, but he essentially ran her out of the job. Question number ten: he, She was ran out of the job and had seven agents working under her. How many would quit in solidarity? So this one's going to be 250 points to the closest to the answer. She had seven working under her. Some of them are going to quit with her. How many? Or maybe none. Who knows, bro? Just a quick check-in with the score. Jeremy's at 1250. Bobby at 1000. Close game. We're at question 10. Remember, we've got 14. If it gets to a tie at the end, we'll go to an artistic challenge. It has nothing to do with how artistic you are. Don't worry. Your whole entire goal will be to pander to your judge. In this case, me. Greg is your judge for this one. That is oh, yes. indeed true. Okay, how many uh, how many of them quit, Bobby? I'm going to with my lucky number. I'm going to say three. three. Three are real ones. Not a lot of them, but just three. I think five of them quit. Give Jeremy 250 oh, points because, right. yes, they eventually fired her and five of her seven Damn. agents resigned in protest. Damn. Harmon next Wait, tried. 250 for Still that? 250. Yeah, it was 250 for. Okay. Because, I mean, the, the options were one through seven. That's right. Right. A higher chance of stabbing. Uh, Harmon next tried to indict her with a grand jury, but they said that all of the claims that he had were unfounded. Uh, he then subpoenaed her to give up her information that she had on the public officials. Uh, she refused to show up yeah. for the subpoenas as she thought it was ridiculous for him to be investigating himself, and she intended on keeping her witnesses secret to avoid their 
deaths. Demise, yeah. yeah, because she she had seen what was happening. <laughs> um, so Jean's mother heard a rumor that Jean would have been murdered if she had been arrested for not showing up. So Jean Duffy took her entire family and fled the state. Smart. That's a good so, move. So she yeah. went and began to teach school in Texas until things calmed down. She would eventually move back to Arkansas. What? Harmon and Co. ended up getting cleared of all wrongdoing and not indicted. Of in 1996, a man named Pat Matriskiana, Pat M. No, made that's a, a sick name. Yeah, I, I think it's Matriskiana. Uh, made a documentary called Obstruction of Justice, The Minna Connection. Uh, about all of this, all of this shit. Um, the names, the cops, the, uh, he names cops rumored to be at the scene, Campbell and Lane. He ends up getting sued for $16 million for defamation. But did they win the defamation suit? Question number 11. Oh, the shit. cops win the case. Ah! But they do not get $16 million. How much are they to be paid? Ooh, there's a lot in between there. If you do get this one right, I'll give you a thousand points. All right. All right. If you there's nail a lot it. of numbers. If you yeah, you got to nail it. There's a lot of numbers between zero and 16 yeah, million. Yeah, pick a number between one and 16 million. Yeah, yeah. Fuck. If you nail this, you get a thousand. But closest to the answer is going to get 250 points. The cops win the case for defamation. They do not get 16 million. Uh, but how much does the court award them? How much are they to be paid? Tax. No, are they to be paid? Okay. Bobby. 3.5 mil. 3.5 million. 300K. 300K. Greg, do you have a guess? 175K. Give Jeremy 250 points because the cops won $600,000. But on an appeal, filmmakers were found to be not at all liable. Yeah. So that's why I I worded it. How much are they to be paid? Right. Are they to be paid? So they were to be paid six hundred thousand dollars on appeal. They were like, yeah, "These motherfuckers are not. You don't have to pay these guys." These I think assholes. that's cool that they were able to appeal, appeal and, and then get it overturned because that shows that what they were saying was true. Yeah, like so, when you see defamation cases and stuff like that, and then they get thrown out, or somebody's found. That's because all that stuff is true. That's always nice. Ah, oh, shit. All right, big guy. Here's the thing. We usually say plenty of time. No. There's man. one multiple choice. There's four more questions. Two non multiple choice. You need. You got a strike. He's got you in the corner. He's giving see, you the rope of dope. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Well, just call me Dan. Okay. Because, one of the, one of the multiple quick? choices. I mean, honestly, there there's potential to score as many points as Jeremy has right now. If you were to nail two questions and get a multiple choice right, effectively. Sleep's coming. You got to get rolling here is what All you right. need to do. <laughs> Jeremy's got a pretty comfy lead with only on. three questions. <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're in the home stretch here. Technically, this is... you get the multiple choice right, and you're the closest in the next two. You tie it, and it goes to Artistic Challenge. Okay? And just so you know, too, we're going to switch cases for the last two questions. We have like a mini on. case at the end. Okay. John Brown is a 16-year veteran policeman who was put in charge of the boy's case. He seems to be on the side of justice and is in the Obstruction of Justice documentary a lot, talking directly to the camera. So, like, he was very... He wasn't one of the ones hiding he from it. He was forthright was, yeah, with everything. Yep, yep, yep. It's like, kill me. Um, they warned him on his first day that the case could be an accident and to just leave it alone. Uh, he goes through the case file and doesn't find any photos or a list of evidence. He found out about Charlene Wilson and went to talk to her and Dan Harmon flipped the fuck out about that. Like, uh, don't fucking talk to Charlene. She she don't have any information. Don't go up to that prison and talk to her. Trust me, don't don't know what he need to be talking to her. And this is the like lead investigator yeah. in the case that she's yeah. like, hey, I saw those boys and get this murdered. Guy's the, this guy's the the like three counties elected prosecutor. Yeah. Like he's also a pretty important dude. Like more than a I would say like more than a police investigator, probably a higher. I mean, that's not how it works. I don't right. believe, but I Who's also down? don't fucking know. Um, uh, so, yeah, just just crazy. Um, I just can't believe that he goes to the file. There's no no photos, no list of evidence. It's an open out. case. Technically, well, I guess it's not. It was ruled accidental. Either way, it's still wild to me. Um, Wait, it was still ruled accidental? 
Well, the grand jury got it turned to accidental. homicide, but the the original case was that it was accidental. So you are correct. Yeah, it oh. is. It is a homicide now. Oh, okay. um, later, John becomes a witness at the defamation case over the sixteen million dollars. He eventually retired, and some say it's from fear over what he found out investigating this case. Oh shit! So some updates on Dan Harmon. Harmon got arrested for tax evasion at some point and refused a routine drug test to get free. So they were like, all right, you can fucking be free of tax evasion. You just got to pass a drug test. He's like, nah, nah, I'm not doing that. That's a violation of my rights. Uh, He would only spend 18 days in jail. Uh, He got one year probation and his law license suspended. But however, get this. So many people wrote letters and spoke on his behalf that his license was reinstated. Wow. What the fuck? You know, he sent all of them a a letter and was like, I will spill all the fucking beans. Okay. We're still talking about Dan Harmon here. 18 days in jail, year of probation, gets his law, law license taken away, then given back. Then the next job he gets, head of the drug task force. Of course no. he is. A fucking Ev- of course he is. Eventually, they find missing cocaine from, from the task force evidence locker that's, in the possession of his wife, in. Holly. <laughs> yeah. Of course they do. On May 13th, 1997, he was convicted of some crazy stuff up to racketeering and would spend nine years in jail. In what what year? Uh, this would be 1997. And he spent so he <clears throat> spent up to like 2006 in there. They got they got hot and bothered about like with the Rico task force in the 90s. So. OK, so this is about the time they would fuck you up for some racketeering shit. Yeah, that's what that's what Rico was racketeering something organized crime mm. or so, I don't know. There were, it was it's but yeah, racketeering conspiracy charges. So he would get out from that charge and get convicted again in 2010 on drug related offenses. Also, there are numerous allegations of domestic abuse, including one woman he dated. Question number 12. Oh, shit. She claimed that he did something to her. Think what about it, Bobby. Did she claim he did? Was it a punched her in the pregnant belly? B attempted to cut her throat. C, bit her thumb off, or D, tried to smother her with a pillow. Yo, bit her thumb off? Punched her pregnant belly, attempted to cut her throat, bit her thumb off, or tried to smother her with a pillow. That's like one of those things that you hear about that you forget you can do. Like when somebody's like, oh yeah, it only takes the same amount of pressure to bite through your finger as it does to bite through a baby carrot. And you're just like, what? And they're just like, yeah, your body won't let you because it fucking hurts. I didn't. I I, I wonder if uh, he felt it when he bit her thumb off. If that's what happened, Greg doesn't even know the answer. He's already that's his guess. That is, yeah, no, that's absolutely my guess. I know a guy who bit a guy. Jeremy, what'd you say? I'm gonna go with D. D. Try to smother her, Bobby. I'm going. He cutthroat, homie. Cutthroat, homie. Yeah. This woman who sported a mangled thumb claimed that Dan Harmon. Attempted to bite her, or he did bite her thumb off. She had it reattached. Like she had scars and shit. Was like this fucking Dan Harmon did this shit. Yeah, you, when and I had my thumb you, you put back put it, on, you put it in milk so you can <laughs> get. <laughs> or no, that's a tooth. He dumped yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So to sum up, these boys' deaths have still not been solved because in the grand jury they did become murders, not eventually. Uh, it seems that they were spotlighting or possibly got curious about the drug drops in the area and saw something they shouldn't have. It seems that they were seen, chased to that parking lot, and dragged back to the tracks where they were killed and placed on the tracks before the train came along. A couple of other things that have been mentioned around this case. One week prior to the boy's death, a guy in military fatigues was seen near the track in this area. Cops tried to stop him and ask him what's up, and he took shots at them and then disappeared. He was allegedly also spotted um, the day of the deaths in the area. Also, a man named Billy Hainline and Dennis Decker were discovered to have been killed in an eerily similar way in 1984, three years prior, in Hogden, Oklahoma. Both did not move before being hit and were rumored to be involved in methamphetamine production or sale. Shit. Huh. That's that's what we got that's for the boys on the tracks. Shit. So I feel so, like so look, I feel like that was the closest I've ever gotten to doing a conspiracy. That was you. I mean, you were you were yeah, touching was... on stuff that like I've talked about in the past, like the Iran Contra affair. That's what like this. That's what led to stuff like this. Because thanks, Kelly G. You made Greg like me more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. <laughs> but I mean, like we were smuggling drugs out of. 
or in from South America into the United States and like it was being done in Arkansas. And so it, it's, it, if it was done where like a Colonel Oliver North took the fall for it, like, of course they would kill a couple of teenage boys who maybe saw too much or like yeah. you say they're out spotlighting, they're driving around in the dark. It probably looks, if you know what's out there in those woods, if you know there's duffel bags full of cocaine and weed out there, let's go peep it. Looks like well, you're looking for it. you know, you know what you're, what's out there. Yeah. These guys are just looking for deer. They, it looks like they're looking for duffel bags full of cocaine and weed. And then you catch them and they've got a few grams in their pocket. Like, you know, you don't, they, they don't know. I'm not trying to like defend these guys. I'm not like, Hey man, these guys killed them. And like, they had good you reason. What the cause may be for it. Right. But I mean, I could also see, I could see it's how it could, town. it could look like a wrong place, wrong time situation that, <laughs> that got them, that got them killed. And that's what it sounds like. Yeah. But I definitely think that the conspiracy of this going all the way to Colonel Ollie North is not outside the realm of possibility. <laughs> That that like this is maybe this a, is a tip of an iceberg. Yeah, this is maybe a small tentacle piece of a much larger, more aggressive <laughs> beast. Interesting. Yeah. I love it. Thank um, you for coming to my TED talk. Yeah, I've got a part two. Uh, I'm gonna throw to break anyway. Do you guys want to take a break? I would love to take a, a little break, five yeah. minute stretch or like. All right, uh, we got a part two coming up. <laughs> uh, come back or we'll kill you. <laughs> see, okay. Patreon patrons. Let's go. Let's go. Greg and I have 39 of you that we need to thank for, for what you've done. And I apologize. Some of you, again, some of you have had your name called. It's just going to happen again because we love you. Some of you have had it called, but we lost those episodes. And generally what happens is we take you off the list. Oh, we did that. Okay, so now we take it off the list on Patreon. Those episodes were so lost that we couldn't even go back and remember who, who we did. So this is everybody. Everybody who is currently giving to the Patreon from as little as a dollar to as high as up to 10000 Remember, you give 10000 we take you to Disneyland. Um, how about I'll just read a couple? You read a couple? You got them up right Let's, there? Yep. Let's get it. Uh, oh. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just start at the top. and uh, You go ahead. You okay. can stop when you want to. I'll take over. Uh, Christopher M. Clyde G. F. and Wisco. J.W. Go ahead. Robin M, Nick M, Shayla R, Mike B, Teresa E, Donald M, Lauren N, Amanda M, Crystal M, Austin L, Eva H, Christy K. Go ahead. Francis J. Yeah. Uh, Valen. I hope I didn't say that wrong. B, Dustin H, Thomas, Julie K., Taylor A, Nicole M, Darian H, Lindsay C, and Christina L. Uh, Eddie G, West Family, Shannon M, Lacey K, <laughs> Jamie G, <laughs> Anissa. Anissa V, Sarah R, Mora M, Michelle L, E Camp, JP, Charlie B, thank you all. Yeah. It's kind of fun that it rhymed going yeah. out there at the end. I appreciate it. God damn it. If you're watching on YouTube right now, I'm looking you in the eyes, and I'm saying thank you very much for giving on the Patreon. <laughs> it helps us. Greg and I are moving into an office this week. Yes. Uh, your guys' yeah. donations are helping Pumping. get us there, so we appreciate that a lot. Um, it's a necessity. It's not just we're, like, we're not just like, yeah, we're going to move to an office. So, you know, some things are happening in our lives, and we'll, we'll share that more of that news with you guys later but that's a it's a cool move it's definitely an upward move it's just one that <laughs> good trajectory yeah 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 it's a takes a little takes a little to get the, get the, it get takes the wheels some doing moving, you know a little, little grease to get the wheels spinning uh, uh, uh i'll mention the ghost don't worry <laughs> welcome back everybody you're here so we don't have to kill you we're also glad you're here because the more the merrier um and also maybe if you're here the ghost won't kill us there's a sound there's a sound um i don't like it right, we're doing what we did again okay That's part two <laughs> you guys part two it's much shorter this part is on dagmar over by i'm gonna pronounce so much stuff wrong here uh this is also by research assistant townsman um, references, murderpedia.org, 
Uh, all that is interesting. dot com. Uh, Tara M Rose. dot medium. dot com. Hellhorror. dot com. And David Malico. dot wordpress. dot com. Question number thirteen: In what year was Dagmar over by born? Damn. Um, okay. Uh, in what year was Dagmar over by born? Bobby. Nineteen seventy nine. Nineteen sixty three. Sixty three. Give Jeremy two hundred and fifty oh, points. And that's You're your not way. even officially out of it, right? Because what's the score then? That would make it two thousand one thousand. Yes. So, um, wait. You're doing good, and the jacket looks good too. Thanks. Does it look good? Yeah, uh, looks good. Bobby. Scott, he, he beat me by style. He can't do it. No, I'm, I'm lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because be the next one is worth only 500 if you nail it. Yeah. So uh, that is a victory, Jeremy. Congratulations. The show doesn't end here, but you no. have one. And nope, guess show ends here. No won? more story. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, the show's over. Let's just all sit here and listen for the sound. Uh, Jeremy gets the points. Dagmar Johan Emily Overby was born April 23rd. 100 years prior to our last story, 1887. Oh. She came from a family of poor farmers, Sean and Marie Overby. Dagmar was described as a moody, melancholic child. While she was leading classes in her schooling, her priorities eventually shifted to lying and stealing. So she was a great student, and then she was like, fuck that. I like that. <laughs> lying and stealing, a little more dope to me. Uh, due Naturally, to this, that shit sounds fun as hell. Thrill, yeah, you know? at age twelve, Dagmar was caught stealing a purse from a neighbor. Um, due to this, her parents decided to send her off to work in a farm in Henrik. Oh God, <laughs> it's the what's the letter with the? <laughs> I think it, I think it's I think it's a hard O. Yeah, 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 yeah. H O J G A A R D. Yep. So uh, that's about 50, mi- 50 <laughs> miles it. away from their home in Funen, Denmark. Uh, at this farm, she was paid $10 a month in exchange for cooking, cleaning, doing the washing, milking cows, and what other farm duties. Whatever, uh, whatever other farm. That's tough. Uh, farm duties her employers would ask of her. Uh, the time she spent in Funen did nothing to teach Dagmar anything and being disciplined for the reasons that she was sent there. They sent her there, to, her there to like learn a lesson for stealing, and she just they just used her as a slave. Oh, indentured servant. She got ten dollars a month. So like when Bart went to France. Yeah, almost exactly that. But I don't believe she learned a second language. Damn. Um, it didn't take long, and she was back to her old habit of stealing once she had gotten back. This time, though, Dagmar was caught and actually faced time in prison. She would spend 10 days in the women's prisons in Svenborg. That was definitely Stuck correct. It. Trust me. Yeah. Uh, Dagmar would spend 10 days in the uh, in the in, in, in Svenborg. Uh, after this you time just go prison. full Swedish chef, dog. <laughs> just steer fully into the Swedish chef. That's all I was trying to do. Uh, so she switched her career path over into waitressing. During this time, she fell in love with one of her regulars, Beesgard. Uh, eventually moving in with him oh, and uh, conceiving a child out of wedlock. Not long after Dagmar and this man broke up, the child mysteriously died. Oof. Upon doctor's inquest, it was said that the infant had blue lips, a sign that points to choking. The coroner concluded that the cause of death of the baby was pneumonia. Due to her past, those who knew Dagmar were not convinced that the baby had a, quote, natural death. Oh, shit. In 1912, Dagmar met and fell in love with another man named Jens Sorensen Fien. Oh, but to complicate things, she was also pregnant with another man's child. Dagmar gave birth to a daughter whom she gave up for adoption in order to save knows. Jens from slander. Jens didn't want to have... Lucky kid, though. Yeah, so she was all... Well, yeah, actually, yeah. I don't want this. I like this guy. Yeah, the kid got out of it. Yeah, so yeah, eventually actually. Dagmar uh, found herself pregnant by Jens. So Jens was like, yeah, I'll put a baby. How I don't many? want some other fucking man's babies. A lot, Bobby, a lot. Um, Jens, however, did not want the child and instructed Dagmar to abort. Um, however, it's totally illegal at this time and not like something you can just go get done. Even in Europe, uh, they seemed pretty swinging back in that day. In 1887? Yeah. Or, you know, or, yeah. Uh, no. Uh, Dagmar refused, eventually giving birth to a baby boy whom she then left in a haystack. 
Damn. Jin's informed Dagmar that he good enough no for in- Jesus. <laughs> uh, Jin's informed Dagmar that he had no intentions of ever marrying her, which prompted Dagmar to attempt suicide. Sure. Uh, she survived, of course, and decided to cut her losses and moved on from Jen's. Three years after giving her up, Dagmar was reunited with her daughter. Dagmar took Irina with her, to, and the two moved to Copenhagen for a fresh start. What? During this time, Dagmar opened up her own business, a sweet shop in oh, Home Blitz God in Amager in 1915. Uh, during this time, she met a gentleman named Svensson. The three moved in together in Norebro. <laughs> how, how European to have a thruple at the time. Uh, yeah. uh, unfortunately, the business did not make enough money and had to be closed down. Oh. Upon this, Dagmar needed a new job and found inspiration from an article in a newspaper she read about a family who had been given 500 kroner to adopt a baby. It was at this time that Dagmar started working as a professional childminder, oh, opening shit. an unofficial adoption agency. Dagmar's specialization was specifically with children born out of wedlock. At this time in Denmark, there were very few options for women with unwanted pregnancies, with no way to support and afford these children. Many were reduced to having to sell their babies. Abortions were illegal oh, at this time. Damn, but selling uh, babies isn't? No. Yo, you could sell you could sell kids in the uh, in the United States into like in the 30s. Yeah, there's a, like a classic <clears throat> picture, like a Chicago picture, where like during the Depression, a, mo- a mother was like, "It said children for it said children for got, sale," and she had like, two kids sitting on the porch. And she I think was, there's like four, and she's turned to the camera like this because she doesn't want to be photographed. But it was like photographed for like Time Magazine or something. Oh. Yeah, pretty wild. Um, so abortions were illegal at this time as well. So many felt that no other choices in these situations where they found themselves pregnant, be it out of wedlock or in a situation of adultery or even rape. Dagmar quickly Damn. came across an ad that had been placed by a 26-year-old woman named Rasmin Kirstein Jensen. On April 15th of 1916, Rasmin had placed her three-week-old Harry into Dagmar's care with the financial compensation of 12 kroner for the first month's maintenance fees, which was to be followed each month by 12 kroner monthly for as long as Dagmar would be caring for Harry. So essentially, they're just like, I'm not sure if I want this baby. You just take care of it for now. I'll, you know, I'll let you know. I'll come back for it if I feel like it. Like a kennel. Like a kennel. It's pretty Hot. much exactly. Like you drop your kid off, you, they train it, they teach it to sit, shake, walk around in a circle. But it's that's m- Pokemon. That's but Pokemon. Dagmar treats it more like the stray side of the shelter, and it's super overpopulated. Oh, because yeah. Dagmar strolled along with the three-week-old to a local cemetery where she strangled the baby and left Harry's body in a public toilet what at the cemetery. The f- Harry's body would be found three days later by cleaners. The first of many murders Dagmar would take in infants with the promise of looking after babies until they were placed with good families. So what do you do when they're like, I want my baby back? Before the Chili's jokes. The deal is... The understanding is most of them are not. As soon as I said it, I knew it was coming. I hope you guys are fucking proud. I even held back. I was like, someone else will do it. Yes. I, uh, <laughs> as soon as I said it, I was like. Um, I forgot my question. Withdrawn. Yeah, I lost my train of thought, too. Uh, talking about how, what, what happens when they, like, I want my kid back. What happens oh, oh, yes. Yeah. So the the unspoken understanding is that they will not is that Dagmar the 12 kroner per month while she's taking care of Harry is hey I'll put your kid up for adoption I I kind of explained it incorrectly I'll put your kid up for adoption if it takes three months you got to pay me for each month that it takes for me to find okay so like uh charging them for foster care yes 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 like the the cares you know instead of the state giving them the money right but the parents are providing but then you kill them right away and you still keep collecting you just take one month because fuck it if you just take them right then and kill them you know you really didn't have to do anything yeah that's pretty instant profit (laughs) (laughs) whoa Capitalism, man. Uh, <laughs> right? 
So, God yeah. <laughs> After accepting payments from most of these impoverished mothers, she would either strangle, drown, or even burn infants My in gosh. her masonry heater. By chance, her crimes were discovered by one of the mothers who would eventually use Dagmar services, Caroline Ageson, who was a young factory worker who had placed an ad in a local newspaper in July of 1920. She sought a family to adopt her three-week-old daughter, requesting a preferably Christian home that would provide her with lots of care and presence. Carolyn explained to Dagmar that her Christian parents were ashamed of the illegitimate child and refused to allow her into the home with the baby. Super fucking cool, dude. Um, hey, man, religion sucks ass, bro. Dagmar promised to find a good home, weaving her web with the unconvinced Carolyn. So this chick was like not like she was borderline like I might just say, tell my parents to fuck off and keep this kid. Yeah. You know? But also, I don't really have a place to go. <laughs> so for not having any other options, Caroline agreed and paid Dagmar the fee of two hundred kroner. Dagmar acted swiftly the same day, throwing the poor child into her oven. Damn However, it. Caroline had a change of heart and returned to Dagmar's the following day, wanting her daughter back. Damn. She Dagmar know. lied to Caroline, saying, ah, I already adopted the baby after just a couple hours, uh, but I don't remember the address. Uh, oh. Caroline, having suspicions aroused... Who was a farm what? upstate. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> you ever been to a glue factory? Uh, Caroline, having suspicions aroused, immediately informed the police. Police arrived at Dagmar's apartment, and the gruesome details began to unfold. The baby's clothes and her remains were found to still be in the oven. Some of her bones and skull still intact. Until further searching, more gruesome finds of burnt bone fragments were found to be filling cupboards in the apartment, and Dagmar was immediately arrested. Question number 14. It won't have any bearing in the final, but we, you know maybe... Make it look better on the scoreboard. Yeah, make it respectable. Uh, yeah. 250 yeah. points for the closest 500 if you can nail it. To how many murders would Dagmar confess? Confess? Yeah. Not them find out. What she's she she's going to confess to an amount. She says, I did this many. I wonder what the noise has to say about her. Come on. Go. Okay. Uh, no. Bobby, to how many more murders? Or to how many 22, murders? 22, man. 22. 22. Ooh, our price is racing. 20. Ooh, and Jeremy's going to get to What the right. fuck, oh, man? Because Dagmar <laughs> can... Hey, yo, noise. <laughs> hey, noise. <laughs> noise. <laughs> Dagmar would confess to fuck. killing a total of 16 children, one of whom was her I don't own. think I've ever been this destroyed. Whoa. Yeah, he, Jeremy. Jeremy. Beginner's luck. That might be one of the higher scores this season, to yeah. be honest. How? And on me? Yeah. Everybody on Discord, just know I'm going to come back. You got shit it on. Uh, <laughs> Dagmar confessed to killing a total of 16 children, one of whom was her own. She admitted to hiding the ashes throughout her home and stashed away in cupboards or burying remains out back. Not long after her arrest, there were as many as 180 children reported missing oh who were gosh. thought to have been through Dagmar's fatal baby farm. This number, however, could be inflated through people looking to hide their own misdeeds due to the stigma around birthing out of wedlock and adultery. There's a lot. 180 is very high, we're saying. Yeah. But this is like the top in number that some people believe may have <sighs> passed through. Death. That doesn't mean she killed everyone. I think it, what I think, what I've gathered is that she would see the ones who were like definitely de the most desperate and and. Yeah. Both, you know what I mean? I think she probably And she just uh, got that last one wrong. That's well and that's what I was saying is like I wonder what happens when somebody wants their baby back and that's apparently what happens. Yep. You you catch that. Damn. Yeah. Damn. That's, that's the only way you get caught basically. Yeah. yeah. I mean Damn, yeah, that was sucks. Especially the same day, though. Like, you didn't even wait a night. I know. Okay, so the number, however, could not... Dagmar's trial was one of the most talked about trials in Danish history, so much so that it led to changes of legislation on child care in the country. Oh. She was found guilty of murdering nine children despite having confessed to killing 16. There is lack of proof. Like, they couldn't... I mean, it's right. just the way the court systems work. That's pretty. Um, uh, that's pretty progressive of them to just be like, "Oh, we actually can only try her for nine. right? Instead of being like, "She confessed to sixteen, so we're getting her for 30. On March third <laughs> of nineteen twenty one, Dagmar. What, what March third, nineteen twenty one. Oh, 
It's my birthday. Dagmar was sentenced to death. This is the first time a woman had been sentenced to death since 1861. Denmark's monarch at the time, King Christian X, despised the death penalty for women, having stated, we don't put our women to death. And on May 25th of 1921, he had her sentence commuted to life in prison. On the plus side, a major shift in reforming childcare legislation came from Dagmar's atrocious crimes. Unwanted children would then be recognized as the responsibility of the government and as a direct result of the Danish government passed a law in 1923, which required the establishment of public houses to foster children who had been born out of wedlock. Dagmar found herself affected by prison psychosis, which is a dissociative disorder that affects many inmates. Some symptoms include hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia. Yeah, da- Dagmar died on May 6th of 1929 at the age of 42. More information relating to her case can be found at the Museum of Police History in Norborough, Copenhagen. And the case inspired a work of fiction by author Karen Sonnegard, uh, Jensen called Inglis Margeson. Or the Angel Maker. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Way to finish uh, strong. Yeah. <laughs> there was also a play performed named Historien Om N. Mordor, uh, Mordor meaning murderer, and Moder meaning mother, which is based upon Dagmar's life. Right. So, yeah. congratulations, Jeremy. You are the winner today. Oh, would you like to take a victory lap? Anything you got to say? Anything you want to... Anything you want to pimp? Anything you want to? Any, anything, man? No, I got I got nothing to pimp really. I had a great time being here. Uh, I love your dog. She's cool now. Huh? She finally loves me. Fuck, man! It took three hours. Took three hours. And now she won't leave me alone. Yeah. I'm kind of mad at you did it the first day. <laughs> 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 uh, it's been like weeks. Sorry about that, Bobby. Uh, Bobby is our runner-up of two. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the first loser. You, anything you'd like to say, bud? Um. I always love being out here. Everybody knows that. I love you guys. I love you guys. Um, I can't wait to be in the studio next time, and I can't wait to hear all these amazing people who did your Patreon. I was going to say, that is what's next. Guys, remember, just check us out on all the social media grams. Uh, go to so- SerialChillersPod.com. It connects you to everything we've done. <coughs> also, go there, guys. We have new stickers available. Ooh. Um, and we have keychains. Keychains are a limited basis, but we've got new stickers. I'll get you guys some stickers before you go. Yes. Keychains are super limited. Can't give you one. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> those are for we're, we're giving it. We're giving the fans a chance, man. Get out there, get your fucking keychain, bro. Hey, and also join that Discord. Yeah, join, join the, the Discord. Discord. We have a ton of fun, dude. We, it's it's. There is true crime stuff that happens, but it is honestly, it's not what it's about. It's about community. It's about supporting one another. Like, truly, it is, like, one of the more, like, supporting places that I visit in my life is our Discord page. So, I mean, if that's something that sounds cool to you guys, uh, check it out. And then, Greg, hit that contact page one time. Guys, this is, that's everything. You go there. You find us. Text us. We'll literally, like, that. those texts go to both mine and Greg's phone. Uh, if you call, it's going to go straight to the voicemail. But if it's funny enough, we'll play it on the show. Or we'll call you back if it's that funny. Yeah. Uh, also, if you're going to mail us cool shit, do it right there. P.O. Box 1229, Clovis, California, 93613. If it's above a level 7 of dangerous, uh, attention at Hello Greg. Uh, also, Lonely Fans with 2Z. Lo- I'm sorry. I, we got to put it on there so I remember it. Lonely yeah. Fans with 2Z. Okay. Uh, again, SerialChillersPod.com for everything. Uh, does anybody want to add anything before we head out here? I'd like to hear from the noise one more time before we go. Let's, let's, give, let's give the noise like 15 seconds of silence to say something. <sighs> I don't think the noise has anything to say. Okay, cool. <clears throat> it's kind of a shame. Yeah. This would have been like the time. <clears throat> the time. Oh, that's good. Man. My, my level of fear. I still kind of <laughs> want something to happen. I don't want. I want it to happen and stay here, but if that's fine. If that's what you want. But. All right. Well then, <laughs> for Jeremy, for Nemosity, for Bobby, Hella Greg, and the noise, I'm Cromulent Jesse. Remember. Don't talk to strangers.
Rock.